It appears to me that uh, the Navy has, has been very lax in trying, in even right. trying to recruit blacks. Right. Well, no, you see us here right now. Right. Right. Okay, we're trying to recruit blacks. Right. Right? Okay. If you don't go in, how are we going to increase the numbers? Well, I'll say this. Since what you see is confrontation. Dialogue between a man in uniform and a college student. This film deals with communication. It is constructed from excerpts of unrehearsed interviews and on-the-scene campus recruiting efforts by the United States Navy. Okay, but it's here, right? Right, it's here. Right, it's here. Okay. I mean, but it's like it's like uh, uh, when you when you are uh, out trying to sell your product to the people, you don't mention it one time, put it on one bulletin board. You did you display it time and time again. That's right, but you have to start somewhere. Right, right. Okay, so this is a start. Lieutenant Commander Norm Johnson believes he has found a place for black dignity in the Navy. His job is convincing others of that fact as a minority recruiting officer for the Navy Bureau of Personnel in Washington, D.C. It's a very difficult job. You're fighting years of poor image. I mean, trying to improve the image of the Navy in the eyes of the minority so that they'll realize that the Navy is truly an equal opportunity employer. Well, it's my job to ensure that all minority groups are aware of the equal opportunity and are given the chance to participate in the Navy, both officer and enlisted. We have uh, the intensified recruitment program in the poverty areas of cities. That's a program to get enlisted from the poverty, poverty areas and get them into the service, because the service, as you know, is a training ground. It is a mixing pot. Also, we have the minority recruiting effort. As I said, we sent our minority group officers to spread the word that the Navy is an equal opportunity employer. Unless we bring the all Americans into the mainstream American life and have them participate, and get what they richly deserve, because minorities have been paying their taxes throughout the term of the United States, and they've been uh, participating with their life and limb, defending the United States in all wars. It's about time that they start reaping the benefits, and I myself as a career Navy officer believe that the Navy is a benefit. It is here at the Pentagon where equal opportunity policies for the armed forces are developed. L. Howard Bennett, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Civil Rights, discusses the Navy's image problem. The Navy has had a difficult time, a very difficult time. All of us know that the Navy has not had the kind of image as the other services. A lot of Negroes, not knowing, still believe that the Navy is still a lily-white organization, or that if a Negro does go into the Navy, uh, he's not accorded the opportunity for a variety of uh, military occupations as, let us say, in the Army or the Air Force. Now, this is no longer true. At one time, the whole stewards or messmen's category was about 100% Negro. Today, that figure is at about 7% Negro. The image is bad primarily because of um, problems that have occurred in the past. And no information has been put out about the new Navy or the new Marine Corps. We're all sort of suffering under the uh, activities of the Navy or the policies of the Navy in the early 40s. Negroes were categorically put into positions of servitude, mainly the steward branch, in the Navy. Dull, but somebody has to be a waiter, or a cook, or a storekeeper. Everybody can be captain on a ship, but when you get the ship to where she's ready for the job she was built for, when you're there in battle, what you did before doesn't count anymore. What matters now is what you do in battle. Like your ship, that's your main job, fighting. And believe me, when it comes to fighting, the stewards' mates are right in there with the rest of them. That's real teamwork, sir. You bet it is. It makes me proud just to be anywhere on the team. And Johnson, don't ever forget this about stewards' mates. They may pour soup between battles, but in battle they pour lead with the best of them. It is hard to believe that uh, the Navy was that way then when we look at the way it is now. I remember particularly when I first went to Great Lakes for duty. This was my first permanent assignment. I was told there was no room in the BOQ. Well, this wasn't too unusual in the war. 
But when I found out I couldn't go to the club and I couldn't get a haircut in the barber shop and I couldn't eat lunch in the officer's mess, I thought that this was a little strange. And they uh, told me that uh, I would be welcome to eat in the second class petty officer's mess. And this was where the other 13 Negro officers were already eating. And uh, this was not uh, the ideal situation by any means. Well, as time went on, treatment of blacks in the military improved greatly. In fact, in July of 1948, President Truman issued an executive order, number 9981, which proclaimed his policy of equality of treatment for all, regardless of race, creed, color, or place of national origin. We saw that integration worked during the Korean conflict. We see it working now during the present conflict. However, we still have problems, such as with off-base housing. But we do have procedures within the Department of Defense and the Navy to try to combat these prejudices. To change an image means that you have got to really produce facts and situations which are demonstrable of the change. That's the first step. You've actually got to change. And secondly, you've got to project the change. You've got to publicize it. These men are the new image. Their very presence indicates change. They must project this on the black campus if they are to recruit the type of man they're looking for. Their work takes them to over 50 predominantly black colleges throughout the country. All right. Good morning to the faculty and students. I am delighted to be your guest this morning on your assembly program. Now today, our visit is somewhat twofold in that I am here to make a presentation and we are all here as the Navy information team uh, serving as recruiters. Our basic purpose, our main purpose, is to disseminate information to you concerning the opportunities for qualified individuals in the Navy. What happens, you don't have what you call a basic. You have uh, officer candidate school, that is your officer, officer training. You would take a uh, preliminary screening test, requires a physical examination. They will review them, and they say, well, this is, looks like a good applicant, we'll select him. Or he doesn't look so good, we'll reject him. Okay, now, once you're selected for officer candidate school, you will go 18 weeks in Newport, Rhode Island. 16 weeks of academic, first week is in process, and last week is out processing. And upon completion, successful completion of that, you receive a commission as instant. You have a three-year obligation after you receive your commission. And the total, total, total time in office candidates as an office candidate will be approximately 18 weeks and three years thereafter. And if you accept it for office candidate school, once you got your degree in June, you will go on to office candidate school to draft football. I feel that really just my presence being here, wearing the uniform and meeting and just talking to the students, not necessarily about the Navy, of course, questions will automatically come, but about anything they want to talk about. I think that uh, I'm making uh, the Navy's image uh, more favorable in the eyes of the Negro or the black people. And uh, I think that I'm being accepted by most. I think it's less than 1% of the students that I've ever met on campus that really rejected me. And uh, remember we mentioned uh, a couple of nights ago about being called an Uncle Tom. Uh, and I've been called an Uncle Tom. I've been called a traitor to the black race and a little bit of everything by black people. However, these same gents or guys will stand up and talk to you. And you can kind of win them over, you know, a little bit. You know, maybe not all the way, but they'll listen to you. Do you think that this increase in population uh, with blacks will uh, eliminate some of this discrimination? Or oh, all surely, of right, sure. You're never going to eliminate all. But just the fact that they live with us on a ship and see that we can hack everything that they have. In other words, we can participate, we can perform just as admirably as they have, and that we know just as much as they will. If you change one man, you've done something. You know, The more contact they have with us, the better off they're going to be. 
that's the way I look at it. So I have a lot of people that, you know, you serve with come to realize, you know, you're no different. You get up in the morning and shave just like everyone else, brush your teeth, you know, get dressed and go out and do your thing. That's the same thing they're doing. And when you live together on a ship, they see, you know, there's no real difference. You both have the same likes and dislikes. You want to get home, you want to do the same things they do. If some of us did not participate in the military, so we we're participating in all streams of American life, don't you think that the other side would have an excuse to say we're not doing our share? You figure one thing now, one thing that irks me is that I pay my taxes every year, right? I do everything that the law requires every year, and I expect the same benefits, right? And I'd like to see you getting the same benefits. And I feel that my being in there ensures you getting the same benefits that I figure you should be getting, right? And that's part of what I'm working for, because if I didn't believe that my being in here was helping you do your thing out here, I would not be in. So I'm worried about the economics of the situation and where I stand. Because I still have a housing problem, you know, no matter what they say about it, when I go to look for a house and they're in this uniform, they don't look at this uniform, they look at the black face, right? So that's economics right there, and that's the side I'm worried about, what he's plans on doing. Well, as you know, I'm not going to get here and tell you that it's all rosy outside there. Because, babe, you don't believe that, and I don't either, you know. <laughs> but uh, going back to the draft card, I mean, each of us has our own bag. This, pay, yeah. this, is a, this is my job, this pays good money. I have a good living by it, and I enjoy it. And especially what I'm doing now, I feel as though I'm performing a good social. You know, no, I have a good social mission here to get more of the brothers in and let them know what's going on inside, because there's not enough of us in there. What is it like to be black in a predominantly white institution? What sort of problems does the black officer face? Lieutenant Commander Edward Seacrest, the sixth Negro to graduate from the Naval Academy and now an instructor there, speaks frankly of the situation. The fact that I am a lieutenant commander in the Navy uh, means that I am equal to other lieutenant commanders. And if these lieutenant command, other lieutenant commanders have come from backgrounds where they should have accomplished more by comparison to what my background is, there is an irritation there. And so they soothe this irritation by saying, well, he is the exception. And this is where I generally am very over in, in pointing out to them that uh, I was at the most average in my all Negro high school class. And in general, I think I can be considered below average. So in what position does that put them? You see, this puts them completely on the defensive. But I think that this, assert, to a certain extent, is a sort of uh, offensive advice. But uh, I think it also is a learning process for them. If I, as an average individual, can accomplish what they, as a supposedly an above-average individual, accomplish, then uh, that potential there in that ghetto perhaps is a lot greater than a lot of people think it is. I think the presence of, of more Negro uh, officers in the Navy, I think, will do uh, immeasurable good as far as changing the attitudes of people because essentially most of the youth uh, of today will have to spend some sort of time and just this exposure because so many people come from backgrounds where they aren't uh, ever exposed uh, to members of minority groups except in a, a servitude uh, situation. And you were saying earlier that uh, you came to the Navy because of the fact that there weren't very many black brothers That's right. there. That's right. Don't you feel that uh, by your not uh, being associated with other black brothers and sisters that uh, you somewhat lose touch with the with the, you, uh, no, I, didn't say, I didn't say I wasn't associated with them no, because well, I go home all the time and visit all my friends. I don't forget where I come from. In other words, you go home for a leave of about two weeks and you catch up right. on what's been, what's been going no, on. No, I don't say years. I catch up on anything, but I catch up on all that I do care to catch up with, all I have time to catch up with. Because one thing, I have a family to support. This is my profession, so I have to work within the parameters of my profession to do the best I can to get promoted. Now, if going back to my family and to my friends back home and picking up uh, something that they're doing is not going to benefit me to help feed my family, make it a little easier. But that's I'm that, not going to do it. Those are the yeah. attitudes that uh, right now we're trying to change, you see. What's that? Uh, what you just said. In other words, I'm out here for myself. I didn't say I was out here for in myself. In other words. No, I didn't say I was out here for myself. If I were out here for myself, I would not be here 
talking to you right now. No, I think uh, for the it's most part, job. this, this huh? is why you are here. You are here for yourself. This is your job. That's recruit. right. But I would not have to stand here and talk with but you. But would you do this on your own if you weren't getting paid for it? I certainly would. Right. You yeah. would. We have all of us are volunteers. He's a volunteer. He has another job. My job is not going out on the road. My job is in the Bureau of Naval Personnel in Washington, D.C. Now, I do go on the road if I figure that, for one thing, I know this campus is the first time I was visited by a black officer. So I wanted to come down and talk to you. You're here because some white, uh, not admiral, but you, whoever is over you, has told you, well, look, John Brown, you know, like, we're going to give you color people. That's not why I'm here. Wait no, a minute. Not, wait, wait, wait a minute. Okay, you say, okay. We're going to give you colored people, you know, a few opportunities in the Navy, you know. So I want you to go to these colleges and run it down to the kids and tell them that in the future, not the near future, but the future, the future, any time after the, to, today could be the future. An hour. Right, yeah, right. An hour from now can be the future. And five million years from I, now can well, be then, the future. Well, that's the case. I missed my whole point with you. What I'm trying to say, we had it when I came in back in 1957. We had it when I came in. I'm not telling you that they're going to do it in the future. I'm telling you they had it back then, and it exists now. In fact, I am here with the rest of them to prove that we are living proof that it does exist, not that they're going to promise you anything in the future. This is something that's here now. Our redress system is here now. Our promotion system is here now and has been here. And that's I, don't, I don't think that uh, the changes could, could result uh, in uh, such a short span of time that you, that you stated earlier. Um, it's evident in the, in, the, in the white communities in that they haven't all of a sudden... Oh, right. But you can't equate the white community outside with the military community because the military, you have forced obedience. You have a chain of command. You have a military policy. And you can get someone by the code of military justice if they break a regulation where you, you have redress and you do not have in the civilian, civilian community. Yeah, but you can not. legislate integration in the military where you cannot do that outside yeah. and you can enforce it. But that, that's not true if, they, if, say, the captain is prejudiced that's right. and the admiral is prejudiced. But then you have redress. That's the whole point of having the equal opportunity branch in the Navy and also having the civil rights branch in the Department of Defense. If you know that, then you can write in and something will be done from the Department of Defense level. Oh, I think that uh, it's sheer nonsense to say that uh, you cannot legislate in a way to change people's hearts. One of the very interesting things is that if you put people in juxtaposition to each other and they learn about each other as persons and as individuals rather than as members of the Negro community or the white community, or an individual of Jewish ancestry, or a Catholic, but as just William Johnson or James Tolliver, uh, you see the basic uh, humanity of the person, rather than your collective ideas uh, about a group of people. I, I really don't think that you will ever change the hearts of people but I think that you can make them recognize that their personal beliefs are not that important. That the important thing is the general welfare. And that the individual who has a, a black skin or religion different from their own or a different texture of hair or the length of his hair, or the color of the suit that he's wearing, has no bearing whatsoever on this individual's right to live the life that he so desires, as long as it, again, does not substantially, or really to any uh, measurable extent, detract from the general welfare. Don't you ever get bitter over the fact that you're a lieutenant commander in the Navy. You wear the uniform, but there are places where you can't sleep or eat in this country. Oh, definitely. Yeah, uh, definitely, especially surely. when it comes to finding a place to live or buying a home when you know that there are many homes available, and yet still you are only being shown at houses in certain areas. You are only shown the sections that they, they want you to live in, period. You know, you come to a new city and you go to a real estate agent, there's a map of all these places. Well, if they say we have nothing available here and we have nothing available there, but we do have something in this one area, 
Nine times out of ten, you're going to go there, and you'll already find it's an, an integrated neighborhood. They're not going to cause any trouble for themselves the way they feel about it. I mean, there happens to be a difference in the color of the money when it comes to something like that. The bridge between black and white is green. That is <laughs> the way when it comes down to finding a house and doing any, anything else is truly, purely economics. And uh, we could go into many hours of discussion about uh, real estate procedures. And that is one of the big problems that faces a serviceman on housing. He may have integration on the base, but when he steps outside the gate, unless there's some caring by the commanding officer of that base to what he does when he steps outside, we will never solve the problem of uh, total integration in the Navy or in the country. But the Navy has taken uh, great steps towards uh, solving this with the interracial boards that are formed by the commanding officer and with the leading citizens of both races on the outside of the base. And DOD has looked into this and uh, instructions being updated to ensure that the practices of equal opportunity are being carried out. But this still is a problem, is a definite problem. As far as prejudices in, in, a, in a great majority, I find that the, the Navy isn't really that way. And I think that it's getting better all the time, although uh, several years ago, a Negro couldn't become an officer in the Navy. Uh, the trend now has changed, and I think he'll find that he might not be wholeheartedly accepted, but by the ones that will reject him, they won't openly show it, and you never know. I think that being a naval officer is one of the greatest challenges for a young black man. At the time of this filming, there were 26 black midshipmen at the Naval Academy. That number has since increased almost twofold and continues to rise. Anthony Watson is one of those black midshipmen. Your home. Does it bother you at all that you're part of the white establishment? Well, I don't know what you mean by bother me. It, uh, Do you think about it? I think about it quite a bit, especially here, because there are only 26 of us here out of about 4,000 midshipmen. And naturally, it's on my mind quite a bit because the question you just asked me is what kind of situations do I run into when I go home? Well, I'm always wondering if, if I'll run into some people who are going to confront me with these type of questions. And I'm always thinking about it, and I'm always trying to think of an answer. But there's, there's no single answer that I can really think of. I don't feel that uh, at all being at the Naval Academy, being only a one half of a percent of the midshipmen that are here being black, I don't feel that we've submitted at all to uh, any white establishment. We're just, we're being treated as men here because we've all got a, a job to do. And it's the same job for every midshipman that's here. And we try to get it done as a man. What do you think is going to be the purpose of the Navy for the next, say, 10 years? And as a black man, two questions. And as a black man, how do you attend, how do you attend, uh, how do you, how are you going to participate? <coughs> What's going to be the objective of the Navy in the next 10 years? In the next 10 years? Yeah. The same question. thing they have, uh, national security. Exploitation. No, I say national security. You, an you ask me and you're answering. Is that Vietnam? What, exploitation? No, it's security, national security. Yes, definitely, definitely. Well, how I, does see you, I see you very much brainwashed. Well, but I don't think it's national security. That's your opinion also. No, it's made American's opinion. Why we don't have LBJ right now? Well, why do we have uh, a... Yeah. What, what are you, you, you going to do as a black no, man? No, no, no you're, 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 you're right, you're generalizing. Oh, is that what I'm doing? American opinion. I'm an American, they're an American, well, so she's an American, so are they. So am I. You're speaking for him? I'm speaking for myself. Okay, well, you can't I'm speaking for the, I'm speaking opinion. Chicago. Well, what are y'all doing other than State College? Uh, we travel now. all over the United States, all the predominantly black colleges and all the colleges, and if it's a predominantly black college, we try to send a few black officers there because we find we get better contact with the black students. We can talk to them. They're more willing to talk to us, and we can tell them our experience and show them that there are a few of us around. And the next time I go downtown and see one of those signs, why can't I see a black woman and a white man or a white man and a black woman? We're working well, on it. You see, you, people have We're to identify. If right. I went downtown and saw them, no, no, you No, know, but see, you're, you're condemning us because you say it's not fair. No, and I tell not, you, I'm we're not working not on it. You can't, I, don't have I, can't, I, can't I can't go instant black. Norm Johnson's job reflects some of the conflicts and frustrations of today's society. 
Conflicts between races and generations. In dealing with students, he must walk a tight line between an institution which has equal opportunity and is sincere in its attempts at recruiting minorities and the skepticism of youth refusing to accept glossed over generalities. They want facts, and that is what Johnson provides them. The fact is that the Navy does have equal opportunity and equal treatment and is making a concerted effort to increase black participation. Johnson is working for the day when there is no longer a need for his billet as a minority recruiting officer. This will come about through the efforts of men like him who are willing to confront the questions and doubts of youth. And from this interaction, there can arise a mutual understanding. It is a time to speak and a time to listen.